The Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Welcome to the Pest and Predator podcast, featuring interviews with entomologists from across the prairies. They've got the latest information on pests that you may encounter in your fields and the beneficial insects that help to control them. This podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Today's guest on the Pest and Predator podcast is Dr. Hector Carcamo. He's a research scientist in insect pest management at AAFC Lethbridge. Today we're talking about relocating good bugs for work. Here's my conversation with Dr. Carcamo. Dr. Carcamo, how are you doing today? I'm doing quite well. How about you? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks a lot for joining us here on the Pest and Predator podcast. What do you mean by relocating good bugs for work? We're really talking about reuniting the natural enemies of a pest that for um, many reasons are left behind in their area of origin. So to to make that clear, let me give you an example. And uh, I guess a good a good example would be an insect that we will talk about in a moment. The cereal leaf beetle is an insect pest of many cereals, including wheat, barley, oats. Most of our cultivated grasses are are uh, vulnerable to this pest, and it comes from Eurasia, meaning Russia, Europe, other other countries in that area. So the insect pest. Um, was accidentally introduced into the United States in the 60s. And it became a major problem in the, in pretty much in all the wheat growing areas of North America. But the natural enemies, the, the key parasitoids or predators that kept the population under control in the area of origin were left behind. So only the insect pests got introduced. So in that case, the good bugs, the the wasps, the predators, are important. Uh, that are important in keeping that insect pest at low levels are left behind. And then we need to relocate it so that they can continue their good work. And that is known as classical biological control. And in our context, when we are talking about relocating good bugs for work within Canada, we are doing that at a smaller scale. So we're not talking about introducing them from one country to another, but we are relocating them from a region where they are found. For example, an insect pest that occurs in Quebec or in British Columbia, and the natural enemies have been introduced in that jurisdiction in that region, we would like to move them around so that they can continue to exert pressure on that pest and keep it at low levels. So that's what we're talking about when we say relocating good bows for work. Yeah, and what is the main benefit of moving them from from one region to another region of the country? Well, the benefits can be immense. And uh, I will give you another example to illustrate that. The very first example of successful classical biological control where a good bug was relocated somewhere else to do good work was in Southern California where they had a huge insect pest, a scale type of insect pest that was devastating the citrus industry in the United States. And they relocated the natural enemy uh, ladybird beetle from from, uh, its area of origin and it controlled the pest to the point where they no longer needed to spray any insecticides for that insect. And that happened in the late uh, 1900s. So for over 100 years, that beneficial ladybird beetle has been keeping that pest under control. So you can imagine how many billions of dollars that insect has contributed to the economy economy of uh, of the United States. So when it works, it can have just amazing results in terms of uh, solving the problem permanently. And uh, that's why we invest so much money into classical uh, biological control and trying to find uh, more ecological, more environmentally friendly ways to to manage the pest. Obviously, there is the economical aspect, but there is also the the environmental aspect where you're no longer 
decreasing the pesticide loads in the environment and also the fact that uh, not, not just in terms of biodiversity or protecting nature, but also having less chemical residues on our food. So the benefits can be just amazing and uh, it can be quite impressive. And also think in terms of the labor, not having to monitor that pest anymore or not having to to uh, spend the time doing the work controlling the pet. So the benefits can be quite significant. So wh- when would you consider moving an insect population? And what are all the things you need to take into consideration? Because there's, you know, there's a balanced ecosystem in that area that you're moving these, pe- these insects to. So what, what all do you need to take into consideration? Quite a few things. Yes, this uh, process of importing relocating uh, an insect into a new environment it's a process that needs to it, it's very important to do the research the background uh, information needs to be gathered uh, there's several things that need to happen uh, I guess the first thing that you need to know is you need to have information suggesting that the the organism is going to be effective right so and, and that is usually known because in the area of origin, that insect pest is managed by that specific organism, and usually it's a parasitoid, or it's also it could also be a predator. A predator, but most of the time it's a parasitoid, meaning that's going to be a wasp or a fly that is has a very specialized relationship with that insect pest. So that's the other important thing that you have to do. You have to do all the background information and all the research to show that the insect is reasonably host specific. And I say reasonably because it's very rare that an insect will only attack one insect. So you have to to, uh, do your due diligence and uh, do your best and get the research done to demonstrate that the insect is going to be attacking mainly that organism and is not going to start attacking other related organisms. uh, Because once you release that organism, it's going to be there forever. It's not taking it back, right? So that's why you need to, to proceed cautiously and make sure that, uh, that you know that it's, it has a chance to be efficient and that it's mainly going to be attacking that in- insect pest. Uh, if you were talking about weed biological control, which is a very similar concept and process, the regulations are even more stringent. There you have to show absolutely with not, without uh, any doubt as much as you can, I guess nothing is completely 100% absolute, but as, as as close as you can, maybe 99.9%, that that insect is only going to attack that plant because you don't want it to start jumping on other plants and 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 create other problems. Uh, with insect pests, uh, in the past the regulations have been very relaxed, uh, and I believe in in many jurisdictions they still are somewhat relaxed when it comes to insects because. Insects tend to have a broader host range, and it's difficult to show that one insect only feeds on one other insect or arthropod, invertebrate, whatever the pest is, not just insects. It could be a nematode, for example. It could be a, a mite. Those are also pests. But you do, you do have to do the background work to show that uh, that parasitoid that you're importing is mainly attacking that insect pest and the risk to the local biodiversity is low. So those are the important uh, things to keep in mind before one will relocate an organism to another place. Because once you release it, it's going to be there forever. It's not taking it back. And there have been examples of uh, catastrophes happening in in, in cases of biological control. So we have to be very careful when we do this. Huh, interesting. Could you give us a quick example of where there there was uh, like catastrophic impacts? Yes, uh, you can look at uh, Australia where they have released, um, now I can't recall exactly what, what organism, but they, they have a couple of examples there where they have released, I think, a toad that they released it to control a certain uh, pest. And it happened that the, the, the supposedly beneficial organism didn't do its job well and decided to eat something else. And then it, it has become a huge problem. And now they try to control the organism they have introduced. There are a few examples that, like these that have happened, and uh, we, we want to do our best to avoid those. Yeah, for sure. Now, because of that, 
who can do this kind of work? It, is it a certain type of entomologist researcher or like the, it's, or is the government approved? Like how, how does this happen? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, usually this work is done by, uh, by researchers that are qualified scientists. And also in most cases, this is public good research. So most of the time this work is undertaken by government institutions and uh, universities also they do it to some extent but in in most cases in Canada this work is done by by uh, by the federal government can you give me some examples of bugs that you've moved before or those you you're considering moving now uh, certainly yeah we have a an example where we have been lucky to get quite a bit of success and I, I say lucky not because we are you know we are not doing the the work and relying on luck to do something. I say lucky because it's it's difficult to find uh, an organism that is very host specific. But in the in the case of the cereal leaf beetle, um, this insect was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was introduced accidentally into the eastern U.S. Then the insect spread throughout North America, and now it's almost almost everywhere they grow cereals. You will find it. Except California, I believe that they, they still do not have it in California. So they have very strict rules about importing hay or grasses or any kind of cereals that might contaminate and bring the cereal leaf beetle, the cereal leaf beetle to California. Uh, but everywhere else, it's, it occurs in North America. And uh, we are lucky that uh, there is a parasitoid that goes by the name of Tetrasticus julis. And I apologize for the long name. We don't have a common name for it, but we, we've been calling it uh, I guess a shorter term is T. julis. I guess we could call it T. julis. So this tiny parasitoid is only about two or three millimeters long. So you make a few dots with your pen. There's your T. julis. It's very tiny, but it's amazing in terms of its ability to move around and even survive all the disturbance that we have in agro ecosystems. You know, we we till the soil, we rotate crops, we spray insecticides in canola for other insects, or we spray for cutworms, grasshoppers. Somehow this insect is so resilient that it, it survives around and it moves around. So when we found the cereal leaf beetle in the southern Alberta in 2005, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Lloyd Dostal, who now unfortunately deceased, uh, he and I, we went to the uh, Crescent Valley in British Columbia where we knew that they they had the parasitoid there. It was released by Hugh Phillips, the uh, former provincial entomologist in British Columbia. So he got the parasitoid from either Montana or Washington. Uh, he got the permits and then he released it into British Columbia. We uh, monitored the parasitism there and we found that it was very, very high levels. 70 to 90 percent of the population were parasitized in that area. So we started thinking about relocating the parasitoid. But of course, we wanted to be to do our due diligence because uh, it's a one, one thing to move a parasitoid within its own ecosystem, for example, say from northern Washington to British Columbia, they share the same features, similar biodiversity, similar uh, habitats. So it's, it's reasonable to move it around like that. But when you're going to move something from a very distinct ecosystem, like the, like say, the Creston Valley, and move it to the prairies, you, know, so you're, you are going to cross the continental divide and come to the plains where you have very different plants, very different insects, different biodiversity. So there we need to do a bit of uh, homework. So once it was released, what was the result? So we we uh, we did the required tests to show that uh, the host range is very specific. We had a, a graduate student from France, uh, Vincent Tervé, uh, now in Winnipeg as a, as a scientist. So he helped us to do some some work, and uh, we we showed that this parasitoid, the Testicus julis, will only attack the larva of the cereal leaf beetle. We even tried uh, um, an extreme situation where we, we we knew that the the fecal coating of the cereal leaf beetle larva it's an important feature used by the parasitoid to to recognize the larva and attack it. So we had another PhD student, Deloitte the uh, Sarup Kerr, and he did this uh, this test showing that you know there are chemicals that are used by the parasitoid. So we took the the fecal coating from cereal leaf beetle larva. 
and uh, we spread it on other larvae of related uh, beetles that are in the same family with the cereal leaf beetle, which are called the chrysomelide leaf beetles. And we, we, we were happy to see that the parasito will not even attack other larvae that have diseases from the, the, the actual host. So the, the host recognition system is very complex and very specific. It, it requires both the larva and the feces of the actual host. So with that information, we, we, um, we were happy to see that it's, it's, it's not going to pose a risk to the local fauna. And the other important uh, fact is that the cereal leaf beetle is the only species in that genus that we find in, in Western Canada in the plains. So we know that there are no, no other potential hosts that could be affected by, by the parasitoids. So we went ahead and, and developed a, a system. Uh, we had a technician, a very capable person, Cheryl Shell, with, uh, at the Lethbridge Research Center. So she helped us a lot to collect uh, larvae. Then we reared them in the lab when we collected thousands of, uh, of uh, Tijulis wasps put them in packages uh, with a bit of honey and water so that they, they survive the trip. Then we send them to wherever somebody reported cereal leaf beetle and had no parasitism, then we relocated it. First place we sent it was the northwest uh, area in Manitoba, the Swan River Valley, where they found the larva of the pest without parasitism. So we sent the Julius there, and then uh, a few years later, we, we got somebody to send us larva on it it showed that the parasitoid is established there. Um, I, should, I should tell you also that this parasitoid is really good at moving by itself. So now that, now that there is a wider network monitoring for parasitism of the Julius in cereal larva, they have also found that there are areas in Manitoba where the parasitoid has also moved by itself. So we don't know if we actually had to do this relocation because the parasitoid was going to move anyway, probably. But we figured that it was a good idea to give it a boost just in case it didn't get to some places. So that way we, we, we can rest assured and, and help growers, uh, whatever they're planting, wheat or cereals that are potential hosts of this, cereal, of this uh, pest, cereal beetle, then they also would have access to the parasitoid. And I believe we are planning to continue this relocation project in the future uh, if there's a need for it. So that's that's one example. Fascinating stuff. Dr. Carcamo, thank you so much for joining us here today on the Pest and Predator Podcast. My pleasure. The Pest and Predator Podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm.